how can architecture help make beautiful places again? What do we mean by beautiful places? As with people, I think we all know that we're not talking about skin-deep appearances. We can all think of picture-perfect places that have utterly lost their sense of life and soul and meaning. Some of them on this postcard. No, today we are talking about that magical alchemy of ingredients which combine to make places for living in a way where the whole truly is greater than the sum of the parts. And my subject this morning is to think about the role of the architect in all of this. I've been in practice now for some 16 years, and since the beginning, I've absolutely loved being involved in the world of housing development. We've worked on projects all over the country. The 5,000 houses at Tourna Grain for Murray Estates, on the screen now, which you'll be hearing about next. We've worked in Poundbury for the Duchy of Cornwall, in Truro for the Duchy of Cornwall. Here, tiny Coed Darcy advanced development project in South Wales with the Prince's Foundation and Ben Bolger. Bartons in Nottingham for Ben Bolger and Nick Tubbs. Sulis Dan in Bath for the Hignett Family Trust. Brasillon Park in Chichester for Zero C, one of the developers who's uh, with us today, where we adopted a slightly more contemporary language for a development of about 250 homes in the centre of Chichester. Or, for instance, this scheme in Weymouth Harbour to replace the old disused council office. It's a design proposition. I'm not sure whether this one will ever see the light of day in reality. I hope you can see that while there might be unifying themes, there is no such thing as one size fits all. And I hope you can also see that architecture can help make beautiful places again if we desire it. So it's been very good to help Roger, Peter Neal, and the CPRE put together this day, which has gathered together, I have to be honest, quite in excess of my anticipation at the beginning, a really extraordinary group of people who variously, I feel, are at the forefront of that difficult business of putting together good development. Difficult. But when I was gathering my thoughts for today's talk, earlier in the week, I nearly wrote impossible. Nearly, but not quite. In the room today, we have all of the players who have it within their power to do something special or not. And that gives all of us, landowners, land agents, planners, councillors, builders, landscape architects, architects, please note the order of importance of decision making in which I put that list. That gives all of us the greatest responsibility, and it is ours to use or to ignore. When I'm traveling around the country, it is easy to imagine that most of our built environment has grown up in an entirely random way. Of course, in one sense it has, but in another, and I took this photograph two days ago in beautiful Exeter, it's fascinating to me that every single facade of every single building, every choice of material, every road, the position of every curbstone and every street lamp and road sign, no less, in the entire country has for seven or more decades been designed and specified by trained professionals. It has been negotiated with and approved in exhaustive detail by local authorities. Everything has happened with intention. Nothing has happened accidentally. And the terrifying thing for me is that things seem to get really bad when everyone is trying especially hard to do a good job, as in this development in Swindon, which I visited recently. Why does any of this matter? Well, if you pay attention to the government's Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, chaired by Sir Roger Scruton, who would, of course, been with us today, it matters not just for philosophical reasons, but because development, which is considered to be beautiful, is believed by the Commission to be more popular. Which house would you rather live in? 
is a question the report asks, illustrated by a little series of house types that I redesigned a couple of years ago for a house builder in Devon, not changing any of the floor plans, but changing the facades. Living as I have in Dorset for these last 16 years while working on Poundbury, I have to be honest, here's Poundbury, I'm not quite sure that it is true that beauty is necessarily so popular. I actually think that most people just want something that fits in, and that is not always the same thing. Of course, it's both inevitable and right that we in this room are looking and learning from the greatest built experiment right here on our doorstep. But I do suspect that Roger and Peter chose their conference venue here in Cern Abbas for a reason. Poundbury comes with baggage. Involved as I have been there for a long time now, I often give talks about or tours of Poundbury where I have to urge people to look beyond the surface. For there is no doubt in my mind that the factors which make Poundbury truly revolutionary and truly important go way beyond the role of the architect. It is to do with the civilized density that Leon Korea has achieved. You can see on this screen, on the left-hand side, Poundbury, right in the middle, the old historic center of Dorchester, and then the vast sprawl of 1960s, 50s, 70s suburban development that surrounds the town. It is to do with the civilized density that Leon has achieved. It's to do with the mix of uses and the astonishing numbers of employment and retail space now provided for on this site in a rural housing development. It is to do with the visually indistinguishable incorporation of social housing, so close to the Prince of Wales's heart. And it's to do with Leon's brilliantly conceived and planned network of streets that turned their back on half a century of low-density suburban sprawl. But it's really not a development that fits in. It was Poundbury's bad luck, of course, that the land allocated by West Dorset Council all of those years ago was on top of a prominent hill. As Korea says wistfully, all of the best sites were already taken. But I suppose it is also true to say that the town on the hill, with Korea's intentional hard edge between the urban form and the rural landscape beyond, even with its tall bastion wall encircling the development in places, exaggerates the effect. Approaching Poundbury from any direction these days, from a distance, and seeing the buildings high on the skyline, overlooked by the dome that, for better or worse, I've designed, I often end up, in my mind, with the image of an Italian hill town rather than a Dorset settlement. And I wonder if I'm alone in this. Of course, in a way, this is intentional. It's worth being frank about the fact that when you are dealing with developments of scale, the right thing is not necessarily just to fit in. What would Poundbury be without its tower? I well remember when Leo was told by the planners that it would have to be subject to a visual impact assessment. But I want it to have visual impact, he thundered in reply. And looking back from Maiden Castle at the ubiquitous low brown roofs of 1960s and 70s Dorchester sprawling across the landscape and at Leon's Poundbury, I can't help but admire his sense of vision. In this company, amongst friends, and in this conference about the future of development in Dorset, I think we should ask whether we can combine his strength of vision with other qualities. Largely, I would say, led by landscape. Qualities which do have that elusive sense of fitting into their place, which is, after all, the most English characteristic of all. Dorset settlements such as Bridport here are, by their nature, slightly messy, typically low-lying in the valleys with a crumbly, blurred edge between the settlement and the rural hinterland beyond. As Poundbury matures and creates its own energy, it has without doubt achieved that most elusive quality of a new development, a real sense of place. It is most definitely, to coin the current phrase, of somewhere, not anywhere. But I will be honest, as a model for wider development, both in the county and in the country as a whole, I sometimes worry that it is too rarefied, too special, too designed, too varied, 
too bespoke to be a relevant, simple, and imitative model for the future. Because one of the statistics that terrifies me more than anything is that in the some 30 years since Poundbury was first conceived, the development, as we will all know, has completed a little under 2,000 houses, and in about five or six years it'll be finished and will have delivered 2,500 houses. In the UK as a whole, in that same period between 1987 and 2018, we have built 5.7 million houses. This is the real numbers game, and it is one that we must grapple with or lose spectacularly, especially as we face a crisis in supply that is so high up the national agenda. And this is, after all, I think, why we are all here today, and which I fear, if misunderstood, will lead to tragedies greater even than were wrought in the 60s and the 70s, when so much development is now failing from those decades and being pulled down after a mere 40 or 50 years. So when I'm faced with any development site, and this is one which we are working on at the moment, large or small, walking around an empty field, my mind is immediately whirring with the infinite number of possibilities for what could be built there. You will not often find me in the crowd of consultants chatting about yesterday's football results or a tricky planning situation on another job, which is what most consultants talk about. I'll generally be in a far corner, typically by myself, staring rather intently into the middle distance, thinking things through. And the questions that I'm thinking about are these, in no particular order. What sort of development is going to feel most inevitable here? What is going to feel most settled, most natural, most intuitive? How big is the site? How quickly is it going to be built out? By whom? Is it going to be built by local house builders, or is it going to be built by volume PLCs? This condition has a huge influence on the way in which I think about the design from day one. It is absolutely futile to expect big systems, big house builders, to churn out the complexities of small-scaled, finely-grained, organic development without a disaster happening. How much long-term architectural control will be in place? Again, crucial for me to understand that from the start, as it dictates the possibilities in every direction thereafter. The Duchy of Cornwall, or Murray Estates, have an incredible commitment to ongoing architectural control that cannot always be matched by other landowners. It matters because if there isn't that control, you have to design far more simply. Back to the site again. What are the underlying physical, ecological, and landscape characteristics of this site? Are we adding onto the edge of a village with a strong existing character? Is it a small site? Is it a huge one? And then, if it is a greenfield site, what sense of scale does it have? Is it wide open? Is it valleys? Is it wooded? What are the views? Where is the water? What's the underlying geology? What, in short, is the lie of the land? This is the moment the germ where Kim's way of thinking and mine will truly engage. Then, crucially, what are the movement patterns? How do people get around? What is the provision for public transport here? How can this be strengthened or weakened by new developments, by what we design? What capacity is there here for a mix of uses, for civic function, for commercial activity, of creating what they call that social and economic change that are, to my mind, the absolutely vital ingredients for building truly beautiful places again? Back now to a narrative. Is it appropriate here to create a story of slow, organic, vernacular growth as we have tried to do in Poundbury? Or is it better to be honest about creating an architectural language that demonstrates that everything has been designed in one go, by one hand, and built at one time? Is the architecture best in a traditional manner, or something more contemporary, like that Chichester scheme I showed at the beginning? And so on. Of course, it's impossible to tell you now how all of these ingredients vary to create a different recipe in each case, but they apply equally to every site I look at, large or small. And I hope it's useful for everyone in the room to hear some of these questions that I think about. And that's before we start on the technical matters like surface water drainage or the bin lorry route, which has more influence than you can possibly <laughs> imagine on a master plan. So now I would like to briefly look at two different examples of development which are currently on our 
office drawing boards, neither of which are in Dorset, but which, in a sense, I think, are very relevant for the patterns of growth likely to be faced here in this beautiful county in the next 40 years. These patterns seem to me to be twofold. Maybe you are a landowner looking to add a few dozen, perhaps a hundred houses, relatively slowly, to a village or on the edge of a small town, perhaps close to where you live. And if that's the case, I hope you feel that you have a responsibility to do something special on your land that you have inherited. But perhaps you're a planning officer looking to steer forward in a successful way a major new development, such as, after all, such as being looked at now on the northern edge of Dorchester. The three and a half thousand houses being jointly promoted, I shudder to say, by Persimmon. And I imagine it is not beyond the wit of all of us in the room to imagine that one day entirely new settlements may be considered elsewhere in this county. So great is the pressure for new housing numbers in the southwest, and so loudly are East Devon and Hampshire telling the government that they're full up. So first, I'd like to talk about a master planning project for a 6,000 dwelling new town uh, called Wellbourne. Of course, it's called Wellbourne Garden Village, <laughs> but it's really not a village. In Hampshire, hopefully you can see the little red dot, just off to the north of Portsmouth with a new motorway junction off the M27. It's very well located. There's a single landowner who has spent 15 years buying out all neighboring landowners. He's in a very strong position. It's going to be nearly the th three times the size of Poundbury, but it is also required, as part of the planning approval, to be built at about three times the speed. And to achieve this delivery, we definitely need the involvement of PLC house builders. So here, my strong advice is, don't expect too much. House builders are not capable, as I said earlier, of complexity. Their systems do not support it. It is better to plan and design for something average and do it well, because by definition, not everything can be above average after all. For two decades now, since the John Prescott years, governments and councils have come to rely on architectural coding as the panacea which will cure all PLC house builder evils. Here's the code. At the level of a master plan, I do believe that a good, very simple, well-constructed code can help a lot. At the level of architecture, I'm afraid I do not. Ben and I both worked years ago pretty exhaustively on the Sherford Architectural Code for that huge new development on the edge of Plymouth. It was a pretty sophisticated document, and the master plan is robust and powerful. I'll be honest, it's not exactly my cup of tea, but it really works. The architectural delivery, to my mind, and Ben and I are both being quite selective about which photographs we're using, is actually shockingly bad. The code really only takes you so far. Please do not rely on architectural codes to deliver beautiful buildings. I've long learned that people need to be allowed to operate at their natural level. And I tell a little story when I was at school. For one disastrous, two disastrous terms, I found myself mistakenly being placed in the top math set uh, at my school. And I was in a class with about eight other children who were sort of basically maths geniuses. And I had absolutely no idea what anyone was talking about. It was a foreign language to me. And eventually, after I'd had two pretty spectacularly disastrous exam results, the, my teachers realized what was happening. And I actually got moved down three sets 
And then I was in a much bigger class with loads of people who had no idea about maths at all. And I was sort of actually at my natural level. And I had a very nice teacher who was, she was extremely patient. And she talked us through simple maths very carefully. And I ended up getting a B. Whereas if I'd stuck in that top set, I would have failed because I was out of my natural level. If you ask for high levels of sophistication from the house builders, the PLC house builders, they will struggle and fail. If you ask for good enough, working within their limits and harnessing their strengths, then I believe that most of them can perform quite well. This is a brand new house designed by Red Row, the Red Row Heritage Range. I quite like that house. And most of the PLC house builders actually want to perform well, although I'm afraid I do preclude from that list of people, persimmon, who really are, in my view, the worst of the bunch, and we can weep for the result of North Dorchester already. So at Wellborn, knowing that most of the site will be delivered by PLC house builders, this is my task. For the vast bulk of those 6,000 houses, I am not looking at all at the rich tapestry of organic incremental growth of Hampshire towns and villages, but instead at the simple, totally generic designs of the second tier of garden suburb developments. Places like Brentham in West London, or the fine and enduring suburbs of Southampton, planned in the 1930s by the architect Herbert Collins. They're built using very basic, rather ubiquitous house types and materials, and with a very strong overarching street and landscape structure, which is very easy to control. At the same time as recognizing the limits of the development model, the landowner who I'm working for is committed to creating something very special. So in a sort of hybrid, we are planning two small areas of the whole town, which will have real richness and complexity, which we are going to design in my office and control in detail, which will not be built out by PLCs, but by local house builders for the estate, who will retain the buildings. A local town centre here on the screen that draws extremely carefully on the vernacular of Fareham and Wickham nearby. And then the major town centre, which we have designed in the language of Hampstead Garden Suburb or Letchworth or Wellin garden cities as the grandest moment in the overall piece. For the rest, landscape really is going to be the key. Thousands of street trees, 50 miles of new garden hedges. We're looking carefully at that elegant Edwardian suburbia, which has produced such long-lasting and resilient, well-designed places. If you look at this mature street scene, this is in the Hampstead Garden suburb, you will see what I mean. As Frank Lloyd Wright said, doctors, Maybe I shouldn't have put this in today. <laughs> Doctors can bury their mistakes. Architects must resort to planting. As it happens, the houses behind these hedges are designed by H.W. Bailey Scott and just beyond by Lutyens. But it wouldn't matter if they weren't because you can't see any of the houses. In County Durham, by contrast, we're working for a landed estate, Raby Castle's estate, on what are, by comparison, two tiny schemes. They will be built relatively slowly by a local house builder in a partnership with the estate. Each will add about 75 homes to the edge of two small but thriving local settlements with small active centers with simple but robust retail. Exactly the sort of place that you find so often in the north of England, I always find, which is just somehow more rare down south. In the first, Gainford here, and the site is outlined in red, we are literally just a two-minute walk from the village centre, opposite a beautiful but now derelict Grade 1 listed Jacobean manor house, which our development will provide the enabling funds to restore, hopefully then to be let by the Landmark Trust. Here we have adopted a vernacular that draws very specifically on local examples. In the second development, in another village just down the road, Staindrop, or small town. The condition is slightly more edge of the town, and hopefully you can see the site edged in red down at the far end, on a fringe of 1930s, 50s, and 60s bungalow ribbon suburbia. And here 
something organic and incremental felt to me as if it would read falsely, strike a false note. So we have borrowed instead from the language of a planned estate village, creating a development that has a soft rural quality laid out around very fine existing trees with a large green in the center and with distant views across the adjacent water meadows that can obviously never be built over, but planned in a way where the design of the houses is highly consistent and largely repetitive. And I'd like to conclude with that word, repetition. To my mind, it's the most important key which can unlock many of our problems. So often today, you hear people criticize the house builders for building the same identical houses from one end of the country to the other. But in reality, is there anything wrong with that? Our ancestors did it in the 18th and 19th centuries. The only difference being that they built in a language that we almost universally find to be pleasing and beautiful. That's London, Edinburgh, Bath, Liverpool. Totally typological. Suffolk, Newark, Cromarty, Clandavery. They're all the same house types. All over the country, house builders have been doing this for 150 years. It's only now that we're building ugly houses that people are offended by the repetition. And one of the things which they knew in the 18th and 19th century was that curiously, the more you build, the nicer a place becomes. As we're working forward the next stages of Tornagrain, I am looking at that vital question of scale and repetition. How much consistency can our mind cope with and in fact enjoy. So there's the Tornagrain master plan, the whole town master plan. The elements shaded in black are the bits which we've designed and master planned so far. And I'm now looking really intently at how we take forward the architectural character for the rest of the scheme. Here, overlaid, is the master plan of the Edinburgh New Town, or Notting Hill or Hampstead Garden Suburb, drawn at the same scales. Huge areas of our absolutely finest town and city building, which all have the minutest tweaks in the dial of variety. If you walk from one end of the Edinburgh New Town to the other end, you're in exactly the same architectural experience. And it's wonderful. We could take more of it, not less. Compare all of those to the size of Poundbury, with a literal smorgasbord of architectural references, the full mixed chocolate box, of which I hasten to add, I am partly responsible, and I think you will realize why I'm drawing a conclusion about halfway through my career, that robust landscape, repetition of simple building types, these are just some of our current schemes, and repetition of material, uniformity of material and architectural language, whatever that language may be, are ultimately what makes the most successful and beautiful streets and places on a wider scale. There's a word I haven't mentioned, of course, sustainability, but it underlies everything we need to think about in this room. To my mind, the most sustainable place is the one that has the greatest chance of robust longevity. It is simply not enough to design places that last for 40 or 50 years before they are demolished and rebuilt as we have seen in so many places around the country. You probably won't also be surprised when I say that I am not convinced that the particular style of architecture, which I call eco-bling, does not meet that test either. And as the world urbanizes at a profound pace, and here we are in contemporary China, I would personally say that suburban sprawl, utterly dependent on cheap fossil fuel, is actually the most virulent ecosystem the world seen the urgent need to create a long-term, long-lasting, walkable, built environment that will be here and thriving for hundreds of years, not just for short decades, becomes ever more pressing, not just in our beautiful county, but far beyond. I think there's a message which is going to recur throughout the day. In all of this, the landowner is the person who calls the tune. You are the ones who chooses, who builds, who designs, and under what systems of control, which is why it's so apposite that my far-sighted client, John Murray, is speaking next about his town. 
And that's why, for me, this conference is so important, bringing together so many decision makers, both landowners and officials, at the precise moment when our small, somewhat hidden county lies on the cusp of development that will, over the next 30 or 40 years, over my remaining lifetime, change the face of this place forever, either for better or for worse. And I really believe that the result is in the hands of the people gathered in this room. Thank you very much for listening.